Okay, so my video is a little bit late this week. I've got a four-year-old daughter and she got sick on Monday and she was puking and puking and puking and puking. I mean, she could have filled this bowl. Okay, anyway, today we're gonna make this bowl turning gouge. It's very strong, it's got a really great cutter on it that holds its edge for a long time and it's inexpensive. It costs about 10 bucks, so stick around. So before we get into the details of how we're actually going to make this tool, let's take a second and talk about why we should even bother in the first place. Obviously one part of it is saving money. I made this bowl gouge for about $10, and that's obviously a lot better than the $80, $150, $200 you're going to spend on a good commercial bowl gouge. But there are some even more practical reasons why you might want to start getting into making your own wood turning tools. Not to make things too detailed, but let's go back just for a second and talk about metallurgy. As long as lathes have existed, there have been high carbon steel turning tools. These are just iron and carbon mixed together to make steel. These work well, but they don't hold their edge very long, especially with modern electrically powered lathes that are spinning at thousands of RPMs. So back in the 80s, there was a development where turning tools started to get made out of high speed steel, usually M2 steel. Now M2 is still iron and carbon, but it's also got a bunch of other stuff added in, like chromium, molybdenum, tungsten, and vanadium. And putting all these other things into the steel changes its properties in a lot of important ways. Not only is the steel harder, and it holds an edge longer, and it's more durable, but it also stands up to heat a lot better. So while you're sharpening it, you don't really have to worry about overheating the steel. Even if it turns a little bit blue, it's not going to lose its temper. The other thing about M2 that's really perfect is that on top of being a steel that you can get a sharp and durable edge out of, it's also relatively tough and flexible. And that means it can stand up to the leverage and the force of wood turning. It's not going to snap over the tool rest, and that's really important. But as good as M2 steel is, it's not the hardest or the most sharpenable steel that exists. If you take that same formula for M2 and add cobalt to it, you get an even harder steel that's often used in the metalworking industry to turn other metals, including steels. This cobalt steel is extraordinarily hard, and it can be sharpened to a really fine and durable edge. So, of course, it seems like, oh, well, we should just make our wood turning tools out of cobalt steel. The only problem is that hardness comes at a price. Making the steel that hard with the addition of cobalt makes it extremely brittle. And there's no way a full-length tool made out of cobalt steel is going to stand up to the stress of being held against a piece of wood that's spinning at 3,000 RPMs. Now the good news is, even though you can't make an entire wood turning tool out of cobalt steel, you can still use cobalt in your wood turning and get all the advantages of that super hard, durable edge. Back in the 1970s, this dude named Oland came up with this thing we call the Oland tool. And that's a high-speed steel cobalt machinist's bit set into a mild steel shaft and then stuck into a turned handle. And this combination gives you kind of the best of all worlds. You have the super hard steel of the cobalt turning bit, but then the flexibility of a regular mild steel shaft that's not going to bend or snap under the pressure of turning. I made one myself a couple weeks ago. You can see it here. And it works really, really well. I used it to turn a couple of bowls, and now I feel like I don't even need to buy a bowl gouge because this thing's getting the job done, and it was cheap to make. There are a couple of problems, though. One problem is that my Olan tool probably isn't beefy enough for all the bowl turning I want to do. Last week, I tried to turn one of these oak blanks using my Olan tool, and it didn't go well at all. This wood's extremely hard, and my little quarter-inch bit couldn't even touch it. I couldn't even get the blank round. It was really disappointing. And so I think what I need is a beefier tool, something that can take a heavier, larger cut. The other thing is that my Oland tool, even though it works really well, and even though it wasn't super hard to make, it wasn't easy either. You've got to drill a really perfect perpendicular hole into a round piece of rod. You've got to drill a perpendicular hole into your piece of handle material. I don't have a Jacob's chuck for my lathe, so I have to do it on my drill press, and it doesn't always come out 100% straight. There are a lot of ways that this process can go wrong. So after doing some research, I figured out an easier, more straightforward way to make an Olin tool that has no compromises. It's just as strong as the complicated way of doing it, but it's quick and easy and cheap. 
The tools and materials for this project are cheap and easy to find. The most important thing is the tool bit. This is a 3 8 piece of cobalt high-speed steel. I see them a lot at flea markets and tag sales, and I bought this one from a machine supply store. It was old, so they gave it to me for $2. Um, if you can't find it anywhere locally, they're easy to find on Amazon and eBay. You also need an 18 inch by one half inch galvanized pipe nipple. You can grab these at any home center. They cost five or six dollars. What you probably want to do is take your tool bit in with you and make sure it fits. The reason these two sizes work so well is the tool bit fits inside the galvanized pipe with very little slop. You're also going to need a pair of set screws. They're these little tiny screws with a hex opening in one end. You tighten them with an Allen key. And you might not be able to find these at the home center. You might have to order them online. Or I actually just went to a regular hardware store and they had a big selection. If you're not familiar with stuff like this, the set screws come with a number that tells you the size and the thread. These are 1024 set screws. What does that number mean exactly? Who cares? It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you need a tap of the same size as whatever screws you get. This is a tap, it lets you put threads in metal. This is a 1024 tap. And luckily, it says right on it that you need to use this with a number 25 drill bit. Now you might be familiar with only fractional size drill bits like 1 quarter and 1 eighth, but a lot of taps use either number or letter size drill bits. They're different. This is a number 25 drill bit. If you don't have number drills, you can go online really easily and order a set that has both the tap and the appropriate size drill, and they're cheap. You're also going to need a tap wrench. If you don't have one and you really don't want to spend the money, you can turn your tap with an adjustable wrench or a vice grip. It's a little more difficult, but it's totally doable. And the last thing you need is pretty much any kind of thick thread that we're going to use later to wind the handle with. I think something nylon would be the best, but all I could find at the craft store was this black cotton thread, and it'll get the job done. It was $6 for 50 yards, so it's going to be a long time before I run out of this. The first thing you want to do is take these threads off the end of your pipe nipple. They're not going to do anything except chew up your tool rest, so they need to go. Once you've got the threads off, you're going to have a really sharp corner here. You're going to want to take a file or a grinding wheel and just ease that over. You want a nice, smooth transition between the shaft of your tool and the tool bit that you're going to put in later. I have my pipe nipple set up in a drill press vise, but if you don't have one of those, you could grab it with one of these wooden Jorgensen style clamps. They work surprisingly well for round stock and for metal work. Now that I've got the end of my pipe nipple trimmed to length and shaped nicely, it's going to be time to drill and tap the set screws. They're going to hold my tool bit in place. I'll start by putting the tool bit in and leaving it so that only about three quarters of an inch is sticking out. And I'm going to put my two set screws pretty close together right behind the end of the pipe. That way as I sharpen the bit and it gets shorter, I'll still have a lot of length that I can pull out and the set screws will be in a good location to hold it, even if the bit gets pretty short over time. So I'll put it in about like this, and then I'll mark my screw locations. I'm just taking a basic, inexpensive prick punch, and I'm going to eyeball center, give it a tap, and I'm going to come back about half an inch, eyeball center again, and give it a tap. If you don't like where your screw holes end up, feel free to just rotate the pipe and do them again in another location. You can do trial and error on this until you get it right. If you've never tapped a hole before, don't worry. It's not complicated. You get your tap set up in a tap wrench just like this, and then you add a little bit of lubrication. Some people will say that you need actual tapping fluid for this, but those people are wrong. This is 3-in-1 oil, and it's going to work just fine. If all you have sitting around is motor oil, you can even use that. Especially with soft steel like this, it doesn't make a difference as long as you lubricate with something. Now what you're going to do is set your tap in the hole, line it up straight up and down the best you can, and then just slowly start to turn it into the hole. It's going to be very wobbly at first, and it's going to be tough to keep it straight. So go slowly, pay attention to what you're doing. Now as the tap goes in, it's actually cutting a little ribbon of steel out, and we call that the chip. 
And if you just keep turning, that chip is going to jam and it's going to break the tap. So roughly every time you make a full rotation, or sometimes less, sometimes even half a rotation, stop and back the tap off about a quarter turn. You'll probably actually feel a tiny little click as the chip snaps off inside the hole. What you're going to do is just keep going. Push forward a little bit, back off to break the chip. If it feels stiff, go ahead and add some more lubrication. You really can't have too much. So forward and back, and then you just keep going. You'll know you're done when all of a sudden the tap starts to spin freely. What you're going to want to do then is back it out and then send it all the way in again until it bottoms out inside the pipe. Then spin it out one more time. By doing this, you're going to be cleaning those threads out and making sure they're crisp and free of any debris that's going to clog up the screw when you try to get it in there. Now that the hole's tapped, we'll run in one of our set screws to make sure everything worked right. The first time you put it in, the screw's going to be a little bit stiff. There's still some junk in the threads from the tapping process. Don't worry about it. Just run the screw in and pull it out again. You should be able to see a nice clean hole with clearly defined threads. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the hole over here. Now I've got my tool in place and my two set screws are snugged down and I can grab my tool bit and move it and I can tell that it's held in there really tightly. You wouldn't think these little screws have so much holding power, but they do. Even under the pressures of wood turning, this bit isn't going anywhere. So the tool, as I have it now, is pretty much done. I could sharpen it up and go to work and it would probably work just fine. The only problem is this pipe is a little bit narrow and a little bit too slick to really make a good grip. As you're turning for a while and your hand gets sweaty, this is going to twist and that's going to be either inconvenient or just unsafe. This is what the cotton thread is for. So I start by drilling a hole all the way through both sides of the bottom of the pipe nipple. Turns out my drill bits are a little bit dull, so I have to use a few different sizes and step drill it to get it through. Once I've got that done, I drill a hole just halfway through the pipe at the top, then thread my cotton cord through, tie a knot in the bottom, and pull it back up into the pipe, making sure it's secure. Then I just start wrapping the cord around the pipe, getting it tight and even the whole way down. When I get to the bottom, I cut off the cord, put it through the hole that I drilled all the way through the pipe, take out all the slack I can by twisting the cord around the handle, then I tie a knot in the bottom and pull that as tight as I can and make sure everything is secure. Once that's done, I'm going to take advantage of one of the properties of cotton, which is that if you get it wet and then dry it, it shrinks like your t-shirts do right after you buy them. So I get it just damp, not soaking wet, and then I get a hair dryer on high and go back and forth until I have it nicely dried out. When that's done with and I try out the grip, I can tell that the cotton cord is really tight on there and the grip is very secure. The last thing that I do is put some CA glue all over the knot I tied at the bottom so I know that won't come undone. The way it is right now, this cutter is not going to cut anything. The shape isn't good and I don't have a sharp edge. So what I need to do is first shape it on the grinder and then sharpen it and hone it. Now, I want this to work like a bowl gouge, and so I'm going to take my spindle gouge, which you can see right here, and I'm going to copy the basic shape there. They call this a fingernail grind, and it does look a lot like the shape of a fingernail, and the edges are relieved. It's called swept back in the wings right there. So the shape here is already pretty good. The angle is about right but I've got to grind that curve into it and then relieve these sides a little bit. So I'm going to start off at the standard 6 inch bench grinder with the hard wheel because this is going to be really tough on the wheels for my turning grinder 
That one has the soft white aluminum oxide wheels, and I'm going to burn up a lot of the wheel shaping this. So I'll do it on the inexpensive carborundum wheel first, and then we'll go over to the finer wheel to do the final shaping and the sharpening. I'm over at the 6 inch high speed grinder and I'm being really aggressive with the tool because it's not going to hurt this wheel any. I'm just grinding and then I cool it off into some water off camera and when I bring it back on you can see that I've got a nice curve and I've got some good relief worked out for the tool so it should have clearance when I'm turning. Now I've got it in one of these homemade tool holders. It's patterned after the commercial sharpening setup that I think all wood turners are familiar with. I also welded together the jig on the bottom, also just to copy that really famous commercial setup. And that allows me to put the tool on the wheel and just rotate it back and forth a couple of times and get an even smooth edge. If you don't have one of these setups, don't worry about it. You can also sharpen freehand and with some practice, that'll go fine. Now I've got that same oak blank chucked up in my lathe. This is the one I couldn't turn before, so I'm a little bit nervous. I turn the lathe speed down to keep my troubles to a minimum and go in for a light cut. I'm just using the tip of the tool here, but already I'm pretty happy with what I see. I've got long shavings and the tool isn't having any problems cutting the super dense fibrous wood. Now I'm going to go back in and try to take a really heavy cut. I'm bearing down as hard as I can and trying to take off as much material as possible in one pass. Again, I'm getting nice shavings and the tool's performing really well. I get a couple of catches because I'm still not familiar with the tool, but none of them knock out huge chunks, so I don't have to worry about that. Then I turn the tool sideways and make a shearing cut with the edge, trying to smooth things out. When I stop the lathe and look at the piece, I'm really happy with what I see. I've taken off a lot of material, the blank is round now, and the finish is good. So I'm really happy with how this tool came out. When I first started out trying to work with this oak, I couldn't even cut it, and now I have a tool that cuts it really quickly and leaves a good finish. Here's the completed bowl, and it's not perfect because oak is hard to work with, but it's pretty nice. And I did this entire bowl with just the tool that I made in this video and a round nose scraper and I was able to get this as the final product. So I'm really happy with that. And if I hadn't made this new tool, I literally would have had to throw this piece of oak away because none of my other tools would even touch it. So now I've got a good finished product. I'm gonna take it down to the kitchen store right now and they're gonna put it on sale for me. Um, the only question is what am I gonna call it? A salad bowl, maybe a guacamole bowl. Maybe my daughter just wants to puke into it. Wait, that was weird, wasn't it? I shouldn't have said that.